Hello, everyone. A um, couple short announcements. One, our speaker this week, Anne, brought um, a sign-up sheet in the back so you can sign up to get access to her paper and I think a newsletter and a video link. Um, and for next week, the speaker is Diego Melgar, who will be talking about uh, fake quakes, rupture scenarios for the Cascadia subduction zone. And introducing our speaker today is Anne-Marie. All right, thanks, Josie. So I'm really excited today to have Anne Sanquini here from Geohazards, and I'm sure she's going to talk about it, but JGI is a fantastic um, group that actually is headquartered, I think, like a mile away from here. So it's a really great resource, and I think it'll be really fun for everyone here to hear about it. So um, Anne uh, actually has a BA in journalism from the University of Minnesota, and then a little while after that went on to get a master's in geology from San Jose State and then recently completed her PhD with George Hilly at Stanford. Um, and that's actually where I met Anne when we were working on a hazards and risk class. And Anne's project, I think, was focused in Kathmandu. And I'd like to think that that's part of what helped her dissertation um, take its form. Her dissertation research um, featured the design and test of a film to encourage community support in Nepal for earthquake-resistant schools and homes. Um, and that represents the first formal application of the theory of communicating um, actionable risk. And I think that's a lot of what we'll hear about today. Um, so currently, like I said, Anne is at Geohazards International, um, whose mission is ending preventable death and suffering from natural disasters. So thanks, Anne. Thank you. You can hear me all right? Yes, great. So I am really excited to be here today. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, before I go ahead, I want to mention that Brian Tucker, our founder, is also in the audience with us today and can help uh, at the end if you have more questions, et cetera. Um, uh, my title is A Quarter Century of Reducing Risk in the World's Most Vulnerable Communities. What have we learned? And what I'll be doing today is talking a little bit about first setting the stage, urban seismic risk in developing countries. Um, I'll give uh, two examples of Geohazards International's work and then talk a little bit about my research, which was related to a project that GHI initiated in Nepal many years ago. And then finally wrap with um, lessons learned. Um, it's probably easy to accept that, um, you know, if you're living in a house, say, in Kathmandu, it's not as safe as potentially a house in California. But what is very difficult to grasp sometimes is the rate at which um, the risk in developing countries is increasing both in absolute terms and relative to that in developed countries. So we put together this slide. The blue countries are on the, uh, represented by the line near the bottom there. And this could be, um, cities that are close to active faults uh, in developed countries, and you could think of this as like cities in California or Japan, um, New Zealand. And the red line represents major cities that are near um, active faults in developing countries. So here you might think more like um, Istanbul, Kathmandu, Lima, Peru. And while the blue line has about doubled, from 1950 to today, the red line is like 20x, enormous population increase close to the fault. And if we look at um, the ratio of the two, developing versus developed countries, order of magnitude more exposure in um, cities in developing countries that are close to earthquake faults. And of course, the uh, risk is a product of population and vulnerability. And like Brian likes to say, if we all lived in tents, this would be a good approximation of the risk. But of course, we don't. And in developing countries, if we can turn the clock back to like 1950, 1960, this is an example of a home in northern India. Not a lot better than a tent, but also not much of a problem. But then you start looking at construction where unreinforced buildings of dubious design, let's say, 
going higher and higher into the air, wider out into thin air, um, perched on precarious hill slopes that are landslide prone, and in some cases combining all of the above, poor building design, steep slopes, crowded together. And this gives you kind of a, a qualitative sense of how the risk has been changing in developing countries in terms of their vulnerability. But we can also do this quantitatively if we look at a comparison um, based on pager data from the Haiti earthquake versus the Chile earthquake in 2010. In the areas strongly shaken, 11% in Haiti died, whereas only 0.1% in Chile died. It's a 100 to 1 difference because starting in the 60s, Chile significantly improved their building code and started enforcing it. And you can see the outcome that they have versus Haiti, where the buildings are far more lethal. So if we combine the two, the exposure that I just showed you and the uh, vulnerability, it's almost three orders of magnitude different if you are in major city in developing country versus developed country. And it seems like every few days you listen to the news and there's some big disaster somewhere. And I know that people in this room get asked the question, well, are there more earthquakes? There must be more earthquakes. Not really. It's mostly there is greater exposure close to the earthquakes of people in buildings, buildings that are more vulnerable than they used to be. We choose to work in those developing countries because that's really where the greatest need is. And our, our mission, as, um, as Anne-Marie said, was to end preventable death and suffering from natural disasters. This is an enormous task, given the, the background I just showed you. And so we really work hard on trying to figure out, are there ways that we can do this in a way so that we can do it in a more, um, a very focused way, using methods that could expand, that could magnify, that could become self-sustaining after we start working with them, so that you don't require a constant injection of cash and resources and things to try to keep the risk from growing. And in that manner, so that they don't require continued aid from the outside, we, it's kind of like a pebble, the pebble in the pond, you know, so that it starts to grow, it starts to spread. The first project I'll be talking about is work that we did improving earthquake safety in the Kathmandu Valley, Nepal. And I'll start with a classic map showing location of Nepal in the center of the Himalayas. Great hazard here with India crashing north into China. The red line along here marks the surface expression of a shallow thrust fault that goes underneath the entire country of Nepal. The yellow dot is Kathmandu. The ovals represent approximate rupture areas. The large blue ovals are like the last four great earthquakes of the last 125 years or so. The very large red ovals are the ones that keep everyone awake at night because, for example, in um, western Nepal, no major earthquakes since 1505, in Bhutan since 1100, which is a tremendous amount of time to be building up strain energy on that fault. Let's look at Kathmandu itself. And we can look a little bit at exposure and vulnerability by looking at these photos over time. This was Kathmandu in 1930. <laughs> Relatively short buildings, kind of thick walls, not too close together. Nice sturdy base on the temples. If we go forward a bit, now we're in 1970. A few more buildings, the ones near the front, you can see some of them are five-story buildings. And they now are um, a little more crowded together. And here, the buildings are starting to fill in completely. We have high-rises. And you start thinking about, well, 
where do we begin? How can we motivate people here to prepare for the disaster? And it's no different than working in the U.S. because they're like here. We're trying to motivate them to prepare for disasters that they think won't happen, or if it does, won't happen to me, or if it does, it won't be that bad, or if it is, the government will help me. And sometimes it helps to think of this in terms of public health initiatives. Imagine if this said motivating people to quit smoking, right? Lung cancer is, doesn't happen, isn't going to happen to me, won't be that bad. They'll find a cure for it, et cetera. And people will find lots of reasons to avoid the whole topic. But again, in public health, they have really interesting way of approaching these problems because we like to do a lot of education, right? We're going to explain that it will happen to you and it will be bad, but that's not necessarily motivating. Education works where it is really easy to see or convey benefits, where there's no competition to this message that you're trying to give, <clears throat> and that in general people are prone to behave the way you'd like them to behave. An example of this, and this is from the uh, CDC, is when we advised parents to put the baby on his or her back when they go to sleep at night to help avoid um, sudden infant death syndrome. And it worked. I mean, parents complied immediately. There wasn't a lot of debate about it. it they could see the benefit, and they did it. Think about this in terms of smoking now. If we just explain it causes lung cancer, is there, are there any former smokers here? Aha, uh -huh. a handful, yes. Are there any current smokers here? Okay. So I was a smoker. That was okay with me. I could certainly avoid reading the message on the pack of cigarettes that says it's going to kill me. Um, then they started doing more marketing and policy things. <clears throat> Price of cigarettes went up and up and up. Right now, in at least four states, cigarettes are over $10 a pack. <clears throat> but you know what? I would have kept smoking because I really like smoking. You know, it's social. It's fun. It's interesting. Um, but then they started doing more policy things. <clears throat> And then they said, you can't smoke in the workplace. And you can't smoke in public buildings. That got very difficult, because if you're an addicted smoker, you have to leave every hour or two <coughs> to join your friends in the smoke and rain shelter. <laughs> and I just hated that. I felt like such a loser. <laughs> and that's why I quit. It really is. And so sometimes I think that these social marketing things can be ever so powerful. They seem so simple. But we really should do more of that, not just education and policy. So moving back to Kathmandu, we are now thinking about what is some realistic, affordable, effective, adaptable, politically acceptable, culturally acceptable solution that we could come up with to help them not be adding so much risk here. And the most important thing that we do at GHI is we look towards a local champion. We want someone in the place we're going to work that's a peer of the other people there so that they can be trusted, they can be listened to, they can guide us in terms of our approach. That could be a lot of different people. It could be a public school teacher, it could be a engineer in the government. It could be a geologist. And this is Dr. Ahmed Mani Dixit. At the time that Brian Tucker met him in Kathmandu, he was with the then Nepal Geological Survey. And Brian and Ahmed, <clears throat> they were younger then, um, joined forces about 20, 25 years ago now uh, with this incredible zeal to help build a earthquake safe Nepal. Ahmed went on to found the National Society for Earthquake Technology Nepal. And Brian, of course, was already leading Geohazards International. And together they joined forces. And there were just a handful of them. 
and they got people to help them wherever they could. And the first thing that they worked on was creating an earthquake scenario so that people could read in ordinary Nepali language or be shown in pictures or be told verbally. If an expected earthquake was to happen, what would happen that day, that week, that month, next year? <clears throat> and we didn't do it in a probabilistic sense. People don't think that way generally. It's like it will happen or it won't. So when it does happen, what will we do? And then the next thing, which was <clears throat> more important, was what will we do about it? And that was the Kathmandu Valley Earthquake Risk Management Plan and the Action Plan. Very important. What do we do about it? One of the most important um, projects that came out of that was this one, which was the seismic vulnerability of the public schools in Kathmandu Valley and methods for reducing it. By this point, um, most of the funding came from individual donors to Geohazards International. But by this point, we were able to attract major funding from USAID because now we had it all lined up. We had worked with them to do a survey of their hundreds of public school buildings in Kathmandu Valley. We knew where the risk was. We knew ideas of what could be done to retrofit buildings or rebuild if needed. <clears throat> and we decided to start with uh, retrofitting um, one of the public school buildings. And we had to decide which one we should do first. And remember, this is not just a technical question. We could do the most needy. Um, we could do one that's maybe close to where all the government bureaucrats are so they could see what we're doing. But the answer was actually in the geology. Hmm. So this is Kathmandu Valley. It's actually a basin. It has mountains around it and about 500 meters of lacustrine fill. And in that kind of pink colored swath to the southeast is the Kalamati Formation. And that's clay. This is where all the brick factories are. This is where the masons are. Those masons who work here in the Bhaktapur area go on to build all the schools and all the homes in Kathmandu Valley. We said, we want to do a school where the children of the masons are going to that school and where they are building all the other homes in the area. And that was what we found. <clears throat> These are two buildings that, it's a relatively rural area they're both in need of seismic work. You can see the building in the foreground. They're both brick buildings. Building in the foreground, the bricks are already starting to kind of separate. And an earthquake would take this apart fairly easily. The building in the back, the two-story building, was in a little bit better shape. And that was the one we decided to retrofit. So here is the building by itself now. And in order to do this, the Masons agreed to donate a lot of their time the local brick factories and, and people with the making rebar and things that we could add to this school donated some of their materials, some of the cement. Um, we had to build scaffolding for it. So each house donated one piece of bamboo to help build scaffolding for it. We did all the training sessions in the village square nearby so the local people learned what was going on. And remember, this was their school. They were very interested in this and very curious about it. And they were nervous at this middle point where they thought it looked worse rather than better. And they almost stopped the project, but they, they persisted. And so finally it was completed. And this was over the course of about three or four months. Um, and then they had a grand ceremony where they, uh, the Minister of Education came and ignot, ignot, inaugurated their new building. And they did another really clever thing, which they then ad adapted and used many times after this, where they built tiny, tiny brick buildings to scale of both the building as it was and the building with the strengthening in it, the retrofitted building. And I show that with the red lines around it. This is on a table. That's a shake table. And so they go underneath it and literally move this thing with everybody watching until slowly, slowly, you see it's getting kind of darker in the day, <laughs> the weak building collapses. 
And it's highly impactful to see your old school building collapse because, I mean, those are your kids that go to that school. So they feel very proud of the work that they did. And the students there are now grown up and uh, maybe moved away, maybe still live in the area, <clears throat> but they would be highly impacted by this. We revisited this area 10 years later. Remember, they had these two buildings. Well, the building in the front, on their own, without financial or technical support from GHI, those masons demolished that building, designed and built a two-story earthquake-resistant building, and it's just beautiful. You see those, those cement lines above and below the opening that has rebar in it, the same on the corners, corner stitches on it. They went on and built this very handsome building, and again, it's earthquake resistant. Um, several families are in there. I talked to the um, gentleman who was the um, head of the school management committee, uh, whose home this was, and it was his grandson now, who also is a mason, who helped to build this home. Another one nearby, they've added um, a way to tie the floors to the walls of this building and make it earthquake resistant. And we saw examples like this throughout the area, and we found that four-fifths of all local construction since the school retrofits incorporated at least one earthquake-resistant construction element. And that made us feel really good. I started my research in Kathmandu in 2012. In 2013, I took this picture. And despite this great effort emanating from retrofitting or rebuilding a public school, they were still adding to their risk, great population surges, a lot of vulnerable buildings. At that time, I was looking at <clears throat> what can I do to help? I was already aware of NSET's work, and I became aware of this theory of communicating actionable risk. And this is uh, published by Dr. Michelle Wood, who is later on my dissertation committee, and Dennis Maletti, whom some of you may be aware of. And what they posited was that we shouldn't talk so much about the risk, but talk more instead about the action. They found that people who know what to do believe that those actions would help reduce harm from the hazard. And most important of any of their findings was that they received social cues, such as knowing someone or seeing someone who took the affected action and that motivates preparedness action. And I kept thinking about, what if you didn't live near one of those schools? How would you even know that this was done, right? You, you would have no sense of that. And I thought, ah, perhaps we can capture it in film. And a um, famous professor at, at uh, Stanford had established that we can use film as a, a surrogate for live people. And so we went in and we captured the experiences of the parents and the teachers and the local masons and others who had helped retrofit or rebuild their schools, showed some live construction shots, and then tested that. So in the bottom left, for example, the gentleman in the check shirt, uh, he helped donate land for that original school and his kids went there, his grandkids went there, and he's taken us to see the local brick guy and cement guy who's talking to him about you know, how you should store it and how you should use it. And slowly, slowly they learn. The lady in the middle is a principal of a school that went on to retrofit or rebuild all of their school buildings by the time I finished um, this research project. Um, and then we tested it. Risk communications is rarely tested for effectiveness. We make brochures and we put out reports and we really don't test if people even got them, understood them, or took any action, made any change in their heads as a result of seeing them. So I had to test to see if this would be effective before I recommend let's deploy this film everywhere and see if it helps. And so I designed and implemented a matched pair cluster randomized controlled trial. These were 16 schools in Kathmandu Valley that were in need of seismic work. I initiated the tests in November 2014 and completed the study in March 2015. So you could see on the left, they're watching someone in the film. 
But prior to seeing the film, we gave them a test, and we tested their knowledge of earthquake-resistant construction methods, um, belief that it could work, that it would be possible. And then since I wanted to measure immediately after seeing the film, we measured intent of if their school is going to be retrofitted or rebuilt, would they help? And would they recommend that others who are building new homes should do that? And the film, um, uh, we found statistically significant improvements in all four categories, which was terrific. Um, and I have released a, um, a, the video on it. I posted it to YouTube. And one of the articles um, about this in Disaster Prevention and Van Management, this is the article that says how to do this. This is a how to make a theory-based intervention like this. This is an open access article. So if you sign in in the back for this, I'll email you links to this and other things as well that I'll be talking about later today. So I mentioned that I finished that um, research in March 2015, and I went back the following month to um, review my results with the um, Department of Education, with NSET, with my um, research assistants, and found myself there when the earthquake hit, which was a very surrealistic experience because <laughs> you are trying to um, you know, comprehend all the data scientifically that, that is going on around you at the same time, wondering what's happening to the schools, wondering what's happening to the people. And the, um, most of the schools that were in my study were damaged. Like I was on the second story of this school just a few months earlier. But those schools, by definition, were in need of seismic work. So yeah. But the schools that were in the film, remember these two buildings? They were perfect. And see, it has a green tag in the middle. Uh, they went around uh, immediately after the earthquake and tagged buildings red, yellow, green. If it's a school, only red or green, because parents don't want to deal with yellow when they're talking about their kids' safety. Uh, they were both green tagged and, and ready for immediate use, which was great. Additionally, we had earlier uh, gone to Room to Read, whom some of you are familiar with. They build schools and libraries in developing countries and told them about the design that we had used and started them doing libraries this way. And rarely do you get an opportunity like this to see two buildings immediately next to each other um, with the same shaking intensity, right? And the one on the left is a six uh, classroom school building and the one on the right is a new building from Room to Read. And Room to Read very deliberately painted those blue lines showing where the earthquake resistant uh, layers are within this structure. So <clears throat> when they go to rebuild this school building, do you think they will do it earthquake resistant? They could. I mean, they have masons nearby that know how to do it. They've seen evidence that the good one survived, the other one didn't. Um, probably if they do it within the next two, three years, I would say yes. After that, memory of the earthquake starts to fade. You don't get as many triggers like that. But what about the half million families who lost their homes? Over 500,000 500, houses um, collapsed or were severely damaged in this earthquake. What is being rebuilt? This is a picture that I got from Sue Huff. She was there not too long ago. In the foreground is one of those temporary shelters that they built with the metal sheets. In the background is a, a badly damaged uh, mud brick building. So will they rebuild same as before? And this is like our worst nightmare in, in GHI because if they rebuild the same as what they had before, they will lock in their vulnerability for generations to come because no one will go in and retrofit a brand new building. Or they could do it this way and suddenly start to change that risk trajectory because 500,000 homes is a lot of homes. They have instituted a policy thing that might help. They've decided to give each um, family 
about $2,000 towards rebuilding their home, but they release it in installments and they have to have inspections in between. So this is all locally done. The building, the owner of the home is in charge of this and they get payments locally. So for example, you get your first 25% of it uh, uh, for making your foundation. And that foundation has to be supervised from the beginning and checked for earthquake resistance and quality. Because that foundation, of course, if your foundation is not right, you know, nothing is right. And then to make the walls, you get another 30%. And then they're going to check that. And especially those window and door openings, if they're too big, if they're not properly reinforced, that's a problem. And so on and so forth. But then you go, well, OK. Um, Nepal is a very poor country. There is not a lot of engineers or masons in the total country that can do this. Who exactly is going to do that supervision? Who's going to build it? Who's going to check it? If you're lucky enough to live near one of those schools, there are people. But most of those schools were concentrated in Kathmandu Valley. And most of this damage was, of course, in the northern area um, outside the valley. Concurrent with this, uh, USAID provided funding for the Balyogar project, Strong House. This is a five-year massive training and support program. And this is from their documents. They will set up reconstruction resource centers in the most effective areas. So it isn't like you have to come to Kathmandu. Train 600 engineers, 7,200 masons, 600 social mobilizers to go talk to the people. 400 government of Nepal officials who can learn what they need to do and help to do it and reinforce it, and hundreds of thousands of individuals. And NSET is leading the charge with this, which is really something to see. Fortunately, they had already trained thousands of Masons in doing the school program. And I can show you pictures of now what this really feels like on the ground. So they have a Facebook page, and it updates almost every day. And at first, I only saw the kind of pictures at the bottom, where they're just training trainers. We have graduated another class of training trainers, another class, another class. And then I saw pictures of where we are now training masons. We're training engineers. And that's along the top. And look, it's local materials. If you have brick nearby, and you can afford brick, Fine, we'll show you with brick. The next group is stone. If that's all you have to build with, we will show you how to build earthquake safe with stone. Next picture is two masons building a reinforced concrete column. And notice it isn't just young, able-bodied young men that we're training to do this. Mason on the left is a 63-year-old female contractor. Mason on the right, 33-year-old lady that works in her business with her. Because in Nepal, a lot of the people who could help with the reconstruction are actually off in other countries earning money and sending it back to their families. So they train everybody. In the center slides, you see where they're teaching um, the, um, in community centers, they go door to door. That's a community organizer and a, a civil engineer. They'll train in the sheds everywhere. And then on the bottom right, this is a building that those trained people now have built, earthquake resistant. The one in the center right, also new building, earthquake resistant. This lady in the top right with the coffee cup, she is supervising one of her home is getting rebuilt. And I think they have a real chance here to actually build a resilient communities in these new areas. We don't know that they will. They're still politically unstable. There are still a lot of issues every day. But I think they have a good chance in that the training and the financing to do this are getting released concurrently. Yes, they're still in temporary shelters. It's not a good place to be. But they have a chance to build earthquake-safe homes and communities. And ultimately, what I hope is that they do that, and it just becomes how they do it. So that if you build something that's not earthquake resistant, you're going to be like that guy in the smoking shelter. You know, It's just not a smart thing to do. And instead, it's this is how we build our homes. 
So that was Nepal. And now I'm going to move east along the Himalayas and talk to you about a project that we're doing in Bhutan, which also I think has the opportunity to, you know, have ripple effects to really take hold. Um, Bhutan, of course, uh, I mentioned, has very high seismic risk. Uh, it's also a wonderful country to work in. Of course, it's in the Himalayas. It is gorgeous. And this is the country that measures the happiness of their people. And so it's just a delight every time we go there. We've been working there for about two years. Here's a picture of a session where we are training um, local engineers to do school and health unit vulnerability assessments. This particular building happens to be a um, unreinforced masonry building, one unit thick, that would do very badly in an earthquake. And it was a storage building, but it was a storage building for medical supplies. So, you know, we kind of need that building. As we were going through our work with them, um, we learned more and more about the school buildings. This is the inside of a typical classroom. You could see there have very big windows, let a lot of nice natural light in, but also it means those walls aren't very strong. Um, the desks, the school desks that they have are rather flimsy. And remember when we say you should um, drop cover and hold on in an earthquake, drop cover under a sturdy table is the specific advice that we give. And these would probably not do very well. And as we saw like in some photos from the Nepal earthquake, schools can take a lot of damage um, in an earthquake. And this was a um, picture that I took just after the earthquake. It was the next morning. And it wasn't until I was on the plane looking at my pictures that I'd taken that I realized what happened with this building. It's a school building. And it used to be a four-story building. And that center floor has collapsed. And I'll give you a close-up and crushed those desks under that floor. School was not in session that day. So once again, we had another learning of if the earthquake happened, if the school was in session, it would be just an unacceptable outcome for everybody. So um, Bhutan wants to build safe schools. The newer schools are quite good. They have a lot of older schools that will take them a very long time and a lot of money to fix. But at a um, Sendai conference in, uh, in Japan, Brian Tucker ran into some interesting people, and they had designed what they called the earthquake desk. Now, these were two Israeli designers, and huh, that is a very sturdy looking desk. So we thought, well, maybe the government of Nepal could just import that desk from Israel and just put it in some of the most vulnerable schools, and that might be something that they could do short term. So we took a look at that, and um, the desk is quite a bit more expensive than their flimsy desks. Flimsy desks are maybe $20, $30. This one was maybe 70 but it lasts at least twice as long. So OK. But then shipping costs were $700. And the most interesting one and most educational for us was that there are huge import taxes on this, on furniture. Uh, to protect their local furniture industry. And then we thought, duh, what, you know, think ripples in the pond again. Those furniture makers, perhaps, could make the desk in Bhutan. They learn how to do it. They do it for everybody. They continue to do it. And so that was what we embarked upon. So this is one of the furniture uh, factories. They have, um, they're very good at plywood, it turns out. There's a, you see a lot of wood around here, and that's an important part of the desk. Um, the two designers, um, Ido Bruno and his student, Arthur Bruter, came to Bhutan and started explaining, and they used models and examples and pictures. And pretty soon, they were in the shop, helping them cut the steel legs, fitting them into these jigs which the furniture makers apparently had not used jigs before because most of the furniture was kind of a one-off, you know, this beautiful chair or this beautiful table. Um, and in doing it this way, the um, 
the components of the desk could be forced into a very specific alignment so that they could be welded properly. And they liked this innovation a lot because it allowed both the worker to know they're doing good work, the supervisor to be able to have a way to test that this is doing good. Um, and from this, they made the frames that could all be put together properly. And the entire time, someone like this gentleman on the right with the white cuffs was there always a government official from the Ministry of Education, trying to learn what this was all about and how they would do quality control because they would be the ones purchasing these desks. And so they wanted that to be good quality. We made about a dozen of these desks. These are the basic frame underneath. Then we painted them. And then we attached this wonderful plywood top. It's about like Nine, in, nine layers, thin layers of plywood. Um, and this is the finished product. And I'm going to walk over and talk to you about this desk because we shipped one here from Bhutan. This is the earthquake desk. This was made by welders and carpenters in Bhutan and shipped here. It has hollow steel legs, so it's very strong, but Two school children can easily lift the desk with each other. Julie and I carry this desk around all the time. Um, it has these struts in it that you see here. And this top of the desk um, is, is the thick plywood. And this desk top is designed to absorb shock. These spindles on the corners, in the event of a major load on here, would start to fail. And this would start to come down, but the student would be protected under here, okay? Think of it like, um, you know in those crash videos where there's a dummy in the car, right? And the front of the car just crumbles? That's what the top of the desk is designed to do. So please come up and take a look at it um, afterwards, and you could take selfies with it, you know? <laughs> Get underneath the desk. So we built these desks, and then we decided to do a live test of the desk to see how strong it was in Bhutan. And we gathered together the villagers and the local press, the local government officials, some people from the military, all safely behind that white chalk line. And the um, flimsy school desk is on the little platform to the right there. So that's going to get subjected first. And they had no way to like raise a half ton weight up or even have a half ton weight. So they got these um, boulders and weighed each one and eventually came up with like um, about half a ton of weight, a little less actually for the flimsy desk. And they hoisted that up above the desk in this big bag. And with everybody watching, they cut the rope on the top and let it rip. The, the height of that bag of rocks above the um, table is a little higher than it has to be because we were thinking about like, you know, ceiling of a school kind of height. But you get the idea for demonstration purposes. So that came down, boom. And uh, of course, that little desk did not do very well. So then we um, put the new earthquake desk underneath there. And we dropped this one on there. And if you sign up for the newsletter in the back, <laughs> I will send you a link to the Crush Desk video so you can see what happened to it. We also put the video um, on YouTube. And of course, if it didn't work out, I would not have made the video. So yes, the desk survived the drop. And this is what it looks like with the, you know, the, the it did what it was supposed to do, right? The, the top of the desk took a lot of the force. It was damaged. But the passenger compartment underneath was just fine. And we're now working with the um, government of Nepal and um, uh, two other companies, uh, Silman and um, 
Air Worldwide, a Veris company, and they're doing a lot of analyses as far as the different school buildings and with or without these desks. Um, which ones absolutely do they need to prioritize being retrofitted? Where should these desks go instead? So that they can make some more decisions. We're also doing more testing of the desk um, so we can make good recommendations as far as what they might do going forward. But we think this is a very clever desk and we're now getting some interest in, in it in other developing countries which are facing a similar issue. Um, I personally would like a desk like this in my house, but this one, unfortunately, is going to be on tour for a while, so I won't be able to take it home. So I want to summarize with um, what we've learned. Um, from the first slide, I talked about how um, we're really increasing uh, exposure and vulnerability in developing countries. And basically, our combined efforts over the 20 years just are not meeting goals. And the risk is continuing to increase. There's an increase in disaster losses. And I do think it's incumbent upon everybody who works in this area to think of just better approaches for how we can slow this um, kind of um, just unacceptable situation as far as increased risk. Um, we've learned that adapting proven methods to local conditions may be successful and may be sustainable, but it's also really hard to do. It's quite inefficient, especially in the early days, because we have to customize everything. It's got to really work for that culture, that economy, those politics um, in that community. They, they need ownership in it. If we um, take a little progress report on our two examples that I went through today, I definitely put Catman do in green, NSET specifically. They are completely self-sustaining. We were last there many years ago. Uh, they've been sustaining for a long time, and they're scaling up. And we're just, we couldn't be more proud of, of what they've been able to do in, for the people of Nepal and what they continue to do. Uh, the Bhutan school desks, I have that one in yellow. I think it's very promising, but a little too early to tell. You know, we have more tests to do. They have more decisions to make. Um, and the third point, which is my final point, is that investment in preparedness continues to, be, continues to be way too small relative to that of response and recovery. And of course, we all open our wallets after a disaster. I do the same. We make donations. We want to help people. But we know intuitively that it would be so much better if that building didn't fall down in the first place, you know. And this is the, uh, uh, an analysis from the uh, UK version of uh, USAID. They said world's investment in natural disaster prevention as a percentage of its investment in natural disaster response is only one to 4%. And if we could just shift a little more to the front, not only do we not have to do so much response, but remember a life lost can't be replaced. So we can replace the buildings but it, it's just a terrible um, ongoing humanitarian challenge. So I, I want to um, close by acknowledging some of our major funding partners for some of the projects that you saw here today. Um, USAID, Stanford's Engineering Center, Air Worldwide I mentioned, the um, Academy of Art and Design in Israel, and Merit's company who's the furniture maker in Israel who uh, owns the patent on this new desk and provided that as a gift to the children of, of Bhutan, which was wonderful. And last but not least, individual supporters of Geohazards International. So that was my talk for today. I thank you very much, and we can open for questions. Hi, thanks for a uh, great talk. Uh, two questions. One is you shared your, your personal feelings about smoking. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could share a little bit more about your personal experience when you were in Kathmandu for the earthquake. W were you actually there for it? And where did you choose to stay 
the, I mean, did you, had you thought about this before? I would guess, so. Uh -huh. Okay, the, um, so when I first went to Kathmandu, I called up my friends at NSET and I said, I wanna stay in a hotel that's earthquake resistant. They said, we have no idea. <laughs> that's literally what they said. I go, okay, well, where do people usually stay? <laughs> so that's where I stayed. And, and it was a good hotel for my project because I would run into people like the room to read people or, or things like that. Um, I was on the top floor of that hotel. It was just four-story hotel, relatively thick-walled brick. Um, and I was with my um, a team. And it was about um, 10 students from uh, uh, Kathmandu University or um, St. Xavier's College. They were my research assistants. And uh, um, at first, it's just a little bit like here. You know, you go, oh, that's an earthquake. And you hear things rattling or whatever. And I thought, wow, I've been here so many times and I've never felt a tremor, but I know they have them all the time. So I actually thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> and then, but the, the, my, uh, team, their eyes went like saucers, and and that so clearly they were seeing, hearing, feeling something that I wasn't, and within just a second or two, it just started to go, and it was nothing like. How many of you have felt an earthquake here? Yeah, okay. I can only tell you it's nothing like that. It's it went like one, two, three, four. And, and it was really loud, glass cr crashing, all that kind of thing that you might imagine. But then I had this weird feeling of the floor dropping out from under me. And I really thought we would go into free fall and I got so angry because I thought I've endangered my students, they're all here with me, we're going to die together. That is what I thought was going to happen. And I couldn't believe that the building held. And it was just going and going and going and going, and the shaking was over a minute, it felt like. Um, and after, for a while, the waves were like this, and then it felt like they were interfering with each other, right? Because it is a basin, it bounces off of itself. And um, we decided to go under the table, and I didn't realize this, but um, the decision to evacuate, I think, is a community decision. You look to what others are doing. And they started yelling with each other, we should get out, we should get under the table. And then they said, Anne, what should we do? <laughs> In retrospect, I think I would have run out of the building. Um, but I could hear the glass crashing and I knew from my civil engineering student that I worked with that a stairwell is one of the worst places you can be in an earthquake because it transfers force between the floors. And I also knew that all of the bedrooms in the hotel had wire grates over the windows to keep you know, thieves out. You would not be able to get out of the window. And I was probably more afraid of being trapped than of dying, I think. So anyway, we waited there. And then the second it stopped, we just ran like hell out of the building. There was water all over the floor, and I couldn't figure that out. It turns out the pool of the, the hotel, there was, it had its own little tsunami, right? And uh, it lost about that much water out of the pool, we found later. There was glass all over. Ran outside, and there were, um, now we're between like the building and these power lines in this little grassy area, and that's where we stayed. The aftershock started almost immediately, and they went on and on and on. And every time there was an aftershock, people would scream. Every time there was an aftershock, they would look up high because they could see things swaying all the time. Um, there was local damage. You know, things fell off some of the buildings and things like that. A friend of mine who ran out onto a balcony up high because he figured he couldn't get out of the building fast enough. So I think buildings collapsing in Kathmandu, he would see like a puff of smoke go up, puff of smoke go up. And one of those was the Dara Tower. That was where I had taken that photo that you saw in 2013. It was from that tower. And even when I was taking that photo, I thought this is the worst place to be in an earthquake. So let me take the picture really fast and then run out. Um, then we, st we stayed there for a while, um, but then we thought, well, it's going to get dark soon. I don't know if there's live power lines down. And one of my research assistants said, 
my parents said, I have to bring you home. I thought that was great. <laughs> and so I, I knew where he lived. I had been in, in their house before, and I thought, well, maybe this is a really sturdy house and safe, and that's great, because there were, it was an L-shaped hotel building, and it had kind of made its own seismic gap. You know, at the hotel, there were a lot of cracks, and I really didn't want to stay there. And so we walked, and that's when I took a lot of photos of damaged buildings just all the way. And we finally got there, and it turned out we weren't staying in the house. They had all dragged rugs and stuff outside of their houses. They were afraid to be in the house. And there was a school building that was being built. It was so far just one story. It was going to be 10 stories. So imagine the first floor of a seismic safe building that was going to be 10 floors, and that's where we all stayed that night. And I was so happy because the people who were staying out in the fields, you know, they're getting all mosquito bites and stuff, and I thought, great, I survived the earthquake, and now I'm going to die of malaria before I can get home. Um, and then the next day, you know, it just, thank God I did my normal thing in Nepal. I wore sturdy shoes, and I, because I never knew when I would need to be in a situation, and we just walked for miles and miles and miles, and finally back to the hotel and left there about three days later. I really wanted to stay, but um, people here were really worried about me. Um, I was posted as Anne has been reported alive, which is weird, you know. <laughs> um, but I thought, you know, if I can't really help them, I am in the way. And because they're taking care of me instead of their family and their in their homes and things. So I, I left about three days later, just as the USAID jets were coming in. And I saw the, like, the local Nepali army showing them where to go to search for survivors and things. But by then, the Nepali army and, air, and military had found most of the survivors. And you know, four days later or whatever, you can help recover bodies, but not, not people by that point. So that was kind of a long answer. But. And that was really inspiring. Um, I have two questions. One is related to the designers of these desks. I imagine initially they had dollar signs in their eyes, and um, that's not what happened. And I wonder if you could describe that experience of working with them. And then secondly, I'm really interested in that 1% to 4% ratio of preventative measures to uh, recovery. Is that a, that's a global statistic or a measure? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, is, is that available um, de-aggregated, like by country or? Uh, I don't know. I could get you the source for it. Yeah. Um, oh, about the desks. Yeah. So the um, designers were a uh, college professor and his student, and they uh, were just really, really into the the idea of designing this. And they needed to get it tested in, a, in an official lab where they would drop weight on it and so on and so forth. So they made an arrangement with the furniture maker in uh, um, Nepal, I'm sorry, in I Israel. And they actually um, uh, gave, transferred the patent to the furniture maker in return for the cost, covering all the cost to um, develop it and test it and so on and so forth. Um, and they would expect like a few pennies royalty um, on the desk when it actually gets used commercially. Um, so I think for um, like in Bhutan specifically, uh, there's no cost to the government of Nepal as long as it's built by the furniture makers in, Nepal, in Bhutan and purchased for the schools in Bhutan. If they make things then that are for private homes, for example, I'm sure that they would expect, you know, a royalty that goes back to the, the inventors of the desk, which is reasonable. Um, I know that there was a, a group in Japan who was very interested in this, and they licensed the design to them. And it was like a flat fee. Um, because they have no intention of like building it and shipping it to Japan, you know. So that's how it how it's set up right now. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you for uh, coming and speaking to us. Um, we read about political instability in many third world countries and, and currently in, in Nepal where the government has changed. Uh, how are your projects able to ride through uh, political instabilities? Uh, uh, at the working level, do things stay the same? Uh, I think answers kind of, it varies. It varies. We have had some projects where, unfortunately, you know, a champion for this project was voted out of office and his predecessor felt no ownership in it and that project stopped, which was really unfortunate to see. That was fairly early on. Um, in the case of uh, uh, Nepal, what they did was we worked mainly with the NGO who was well accepted by the government and quite good at um, working with the government and whoever was in charge. Um, because they were um, helping them, they were bringing, they were making them look good, they were teaching them, and they were doing it, you know, for the good of the people of Nepal. Um, and I think us being able to work with an NGO that could work in parallel to the government was a real asset. Um, but at the same time, this NGO was very familiar with the government and what to watch for and things like that. Um, in Bhutan, we are not concerned because the, um, the government is, is reasonably stable. It's a kingdom. It still is. Um, and even though, for example, just recently, uh, they had some turnover in the um, Department of Education, um, we have enough people that we've been working with so that they understand it and they think it's a good idea. Plus, we have um, two full-time employees of Geohazards International who live in Bhutan. They are Bhutanese. They are kind of part of the, the um, you know, ecosystem there. And so they can anticipate things and, and um, uh, let us know we need to, you know, talk with this guy or we need to make arrangements with this guy to see if that will help. Did you want to add anything to that, Brian? Is that generally the... One catching thing was that actually we, we put our money on different courses and, uh, oh, sorry. So we, we tried, definitely we uh, know that there can be instability and so we try to um, form alliances with various people. Um, and in the case of Nepal, it was uh, Amod and I, at, at the conclusion of one of our projects, got invited to meet the king and it was a very moving uh, experience. Um, and he um, said that he had heard of what we were doing and he wanted to personally promote uh, the work uh, in schools. And he said, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm serious about this and I want you, if I forget, but he said, I get distracted on different things, but sometimes I uh, forget. And I, if I do, I want you to nudge me. And he turned to a mode and said, I want, I'm serious, I want you to nudge me. And I remember uh, Amode knelt on his knees and acknowledged mission, I mean, a message received. And, uh, and we left that, so, uh, left that meeting audience, as you will, um, so in, in, in encouraged. But um, within about three months, he was assassinated the, the uh, king by his son, of, no less. So um, we, we have other stories of, of, of this kind of thing. So basically we try to form alliances with a, a network of people and indeed w there are instabilities, but uh, I think by, by forming alliances with a couple of different people we can. And just one little uh, correction, Bhutan, is the, the king uh, abdicated and uh, it, it, he, there is still a king in Bhutan, but it's a parliamentary democracy Sorry. now. Sorry. I was wondering, um, 
how do you how in Nepal how do they how do you implement the uh, school safety? Is it through a building code, or is it just sort of on an individual? Each school tries to do the best they can with certain seismic design elements, and then also, um, do the communities? Is there any sign that it's crossing over to other buildings? Like they look at the schools and then say their mm -hmm. own houses mm -hmm. get reinforced also? Yeah, okay. So for the, uh, let me answer the last part first. Um, we are starting to see some crossover, be, but it's only in situations where uh, the Masons who worked on the school actually live in that village. That's like our best case. Um, but oftentimes, like I remember walking through the alleyway with the school principal back to her school, and she diverted me. She said, come see my house. And it was, um, they had wanted to put on a, a heavy flat um, roof uh, because they want to, um, you know, store grain up there and things like that. But she had a metal roof. She said the flat heavy roof would have been unsafe for my building but now I feel safe. And they used to always say that, now I feel safe. And that seemed to be their motivator um, of whether or not to make that trigger. So, so we do see some, some spreading. But as far as how it works, the, um, so the Department of Education is, is under Ministry of Education in Nepal, and they have um, funding associated with the schools, but the schools, public school buildings, at least in Nepal, are now owned by the local community. So in order to retrofit or rebuild a, a school in the local community, the local community have to come up with some funds for that. The village, the village development council typically will come up with some of that. Um, for the school earthquake safety program, that's still getting funding from outside. And so a big chunk of it will go towards um, uh, the cost of redoing the building, but separately it pays for cost of training the local masons to redo the building. In that manner, um, you don't just like give all the money to the village and hope that they do it correctly. It comes in in stages and so it's um, implemented that way. It's also done as a holistic program, so it's the whole school earthquake safety program. So the um, students and their parents go through earthquake drills, they learn how to make kits, how to use a fire extinguisher, they learn why earthquakes happen, um, and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's an entire program, like soft skills, hard skills. Um, and they had completed about 300 or so public schools in Kathmandu Valley, and they had just started expanding it to, I think it was like 30 districts outside Kathmandu. <coughs> And I was working with um, an engineer in the Department of Education who was responsible for the buildings. They provide example building designs for all of these schools for new construction. Um, but as far as retrofitting them, they were kind of resistant to the idea in the remote villages because again, they'd never heard of it. They didn't understand what it might do. And so he wanted to take my new film where I had changed the ending now so they could see the building survive and show that to um, the local community about the school to give them the idea that people like them had done this and, and it could be done. So that's how the program works and there are now uh, programs like this in some other countries modeled after um, what they've been doing in Nepal. Um, so my question actually follows on well from what you just said. I mean, there, the global need to address earthquake risk is so vast, but what you've been describing takes so much focused effort in developing relationships and building a program. So I imagine as an organization, you have to come up against this you know, breadth of impact versus depth of impact. And I'm wondering how you see that balance and how you see strategies for expanding the, that deeper impact globally. I'll take a crack at it and I'll let Brian add on. <laughs> the, um, uh, it's relatively easy for us to do breath. It's easy for anyone to do breath. Um, we've trained probably close to a million school children in India about 
that there are earthquakes. You should go home and make a kit with your family and, and have emergency escape and things like that. But we know that when you're looking at reducing risk, you know, it helps. It gets them oriented towards the message, but it's not that meaningful as far as actually reducing risk. And so I would say that we really prioritize depth so that we can establish something that really works well for them and local champions, et cetera, even if it takes us several years to get it to that point. We were in Nepal for about three years before we really started getting the traction in the USAID program and things like that. But we were only in Nepal for five years, and we have not been back since. And so I feel like that was a real um, highly leveraged um, investment of time and money on our part to help get that going like that. Um, we're now moving in Nepal again to a more broad approach because there are organizations that want to redirect funding for Western Nepal where they have that huge seismic gap where you know they haven't done a lot yet as far as preparedness activities and the first thing that we will do will be very broad and reach as many people as we can but then after we work there for a little bit start finding those high leverage projects and, and the reason a school project is such high leverage is because you reach so many people. So many things have to be touched when you do that type of a project. Um, so we'll be able to do that kind of thing in the future. Um, we also are somewhat limited because we don't strictly go into the most vulnerable countries. It has to be at least politically stable enough for us to work there safely. So that's, you know, comes down in terms of uh, our list of where we might work. Um, but we have a long queue of things and we have a, a theory of change as far as how um, in a community will go about adopting you know, new technology, new ideas to be able to make themselves safe. And we try to follow that because it's, when it does work, it can be very effective and very rewarding. And as we get additional funding, we will be able to do more of that in more countries with more organizations because we, we try to design what we do so that it can be scaled, so that others can you know, apply our method in other countries. Like right now, we're working in Haiti in two locations that were not destroyed by the earthquake because you know they're at great risk. And so again, we go in and we start establishing the relationships. Well, we have them from, from before. But the idea is, again, a race against time. How much can we get those folks to start taking action um, prior to the next earthquake happening? Um, oh, I was just noticing on your map with the, the big events on it, and I was wondering if, are there lesser, many lesser events to keep this fresh? And I was wondering how fresh this will stay in people's minds. Oh, there was actually research done on, um, okay, right after the bad earthquake, people will try to do the right thing, right? Like right after a disaster, they'll, whatever, change their, their how they build their homes or the flood maps or whatever. And that wears off in two to three years. Um, it turns out that in Kathmandu Valley, I did ask the question in my research, have you felt an earthquake in the last two years? 80% said yes. And I thought, hmm, that might be good or bad as far as motivating them because if it's just a minor earthquake and it doesn't do a lot of damage, see, my building was fine. You know, we survived an earthquake. Uh, the last major earthquake they felt in Kathmandu Valley was 1934. Um, and only some of the very oldest people had recollection of that. And they would tell vivid stories, you know, run away from the buildings and do this and do this. Um, but for the most part, I mean, really, even like when I was TAing the hazards class and I would talk about, well, the Loma Prieta earthquake was not the big one. Honestly, the students in the class had no clue about the Loma Prieta earthquake, right? That was 1988. That's ancient history. It doesn't exist, you know, in their minds. So we do have a window of two to three years afterwards um, when it's vivid. But we can refresh that window, if you will. For example, in um, Bhutan, 
they don't try to explain about um, here's what would happen in this ancient earthquake. They'll show pictures from Nepal. They took up a collection in our, our office in Bhutan for the people in Nepal. So, so it's very meaningful for them locally. And, um, but, but if I go further with the point, though, just because you increase someone's risk awareness does not necessarily you've done anything as far as motivating them to do something about it. You really need these other pieces in place. And, um, yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, uh, we're going to meet at, let's say, noon to walk over to the patio for lunch with Anne. And she'll be around the rest of the day if you'd like to meet with her or chat with her. And let's thank her again. Thanks so much.